Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Each week we talk about heart rate variability and how it can be used to improve your overall health and wellness. Please consider the information in this podcast for your informational use and not medical advice. Please see your medical provider to apply any of the strategies outlined in this episode. Heart Rate Variability Podcast is a production of Optimal LLC and Optimal HRV. Check us out at OptimalHRV.com. Please enjoy the show. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I'm here today with two very special, brilliant women that I'm excited to um, talk to and have a wonderful conversation with. So our listeners will be familiar with Dr. Ina Hazan. Ina, welcome back to the show. Um, First time in a while, you've been in the interviewer seat. So uh, give you a little bit of break from all my annoying questions. And our very special guest today is Dr. Christine Sanchez. Uh, Dr. Sanchez, welcome. Um, I'm I'm so excited to have you uh, on the podcast and explore your expertise. We're going to kind of touch on with high performers, uh, but but just I know you bring a wealth of knowledge um, on performance and heart rate variability. So I'm excited to nerd out with you um, on this episode. So I would love just uh, a quick introduction of yourself before uh, we dive in. Sure. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be on your podcast. Such such an honor, such a delight to be here today. So a little bit about me, yeah. Dr. Christine Sanchez. My background is in sport and performance psychology. So I've been in the field oh, for almost probably 20 years, um, working with performers in all realms of the spectrum, everything from uh, yeah, from athletes to elite professional sport to elite uh, groups within the military, executives, uh, even physicians. So basically any type of performer who needs to perform at their best when it matters the most. And awesome. I have uh, a big area of specialty of mine, probably since you asked me to speak today, is I do have a specialty in uh, in biofeedback training. So I'm also, I'm, while well, I'm a certified mental performance consultant, I'm also board certified in biofeedback. Very cool. You know, you want to get started okay. out with the first question? Okay. See, am I already failing in my interviewer job? <laughs> 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 um, Christine, uh, so I have uh, I would love to hear a bit more about your approach to using um, heart durability biofeedback and other modalities of biofeedback with uh, peak performers. You know, I know, you know, in the 10 years we've known each other, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, I, I've always uh, been fascinated with little bits of uh, uh, wisdom that I uh, catch from you and, you know, how to approach uh, peak performers. And, you know, I find myself, you know, thinking about, you know, these bits of wisdom that I've learned uh, from you in my work. So um, I would love to, um, for the rest of our audience uh, to hear that and learn from you. So, um, Anything you can tell us about your specific approach to using biofeedback with elite performers? Sure, definitely. I first I'll start out um, just by saying when I first got into biofeedback. So anybody out there who's listening who's not used to working with biofeedback, I did not enter the field knowing about biofeedback. Uh, it was more I just I was fortunate enough in that uh, when I first started working with the military, we had biofeedback, and back in the day, it was. Uh, it was it was M wave through through heart math, and uh, we were using biofeedback heart rate variability to work with service members on helping them improve their self regulation skills, so that they could perform in the heat of the moment. Like I said when it matters the most, as they're going through very uh, rigorous training and very high attrition rate um, um, selection programs. So it was M wave back in the day. I had no idea about how to use biofeedback. It was not a specialty of mine. When I was in school, so I really had to start, you know, very much from the basics. And what really caught me on to biofeedback was the more I used it, um, the more I saw the utility in that when you're working with a competitive type A, high drive type person, um, and, and we're teaching them these intangible skills, like everybody knows how to breathe, you know, breathe to relax. We all know, take a deep breath. And so it's like, okay, yeah, this this doesn't sound, this is not you know, not too sexy, not too cool. Yeah. Take a breath. Yeah. I want to know like, what's the leading cutting edge, 
you know, way to be a peak performer. Yeah. And yeah. the thing with biofeedback, the beauty in it is that it will give you objective information on um, aspects of your physiology that kind of seem like intangible. Oh, we all know how to breathe. Yeah, deep breathe. People have been telling me that forever. Um, so the more I used it, the more I saw it helped me teach these skills that seemed intangible. And then when you get objective, um, these objective data and metrics, and, and as time evolved and I worked, you know, within different commands and I, I was able to actually get, once I was able to get into clinical um, biofeedback, that really enabled me to go much more in depth. And that's actually how I met Ina. Ina um, mentored me in, in uh, heart, well, actually in my um, BCB board certified biofeedback um, certification and, and mindfulness and heart rate variability and capnography. And so just being able to utilize that, um, especially as I was working with um, some of our most elite performers to get that objective data and to show people that, okay, this is where you're at. This is where I need you to be, to be that peak performer. It's like, okay, great. Yes, you bought me. I'm on board. Let's go. And then when they see how challenging it can be at times um, and your high level performers you know, what they know best is, you know, to put forth hard work and effort into what they're doing. I often um, used to get asked, am I the best breather you've ever seen? And as we know, with heart, you know, with heart rate variability biofeedback training, this is all about learning to let go, like part of being mentally agile and, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally resilient is to learn to let go. And that involves not trying and not putting forth a lot of effort. So um, it has been a great tool in teaching self-regulation um, and learning how to, I guess some of the requests I would get would be, how can I, you know, I need to be better at amping down, like in those short pauses that we get so I can stay like, you know, activated, but not too activated. And then also more importantly, you know, at the end of the day, when we go home, how do we not become too irritable? And so more from a wellness and chronic stress perspective, how can we use um, you know, biofeedback, specifically heart rate variability biofeedback to um, help develop the skills to keep that nervous system balanced and to help them really be able to let go at the end of the day so that we can have greater patience and greater presence when we come home uh, with, our, with our family, with our friends, with our pets. So that's awesome. I, I wonder what, what are some of the kind of, you, you mentioned a little bit, but some of the key takeaways, because, because I'm fascinated with your experience of not, you, 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 it sounds like you got the position to work with these high performers and then biofeedback came along that was sort of new to you and then new to your work. And now mm -hmm. you, you have, you've developed this expertise over a decade plus I just kind of, as you look at their their data, as you work with these individuals, I just kind of, what insights has it given you over the years on human performance, uh, especially with these high uh, performers? Mm -hmm. uh, so one, when I, so I guess when working with these high performers in biofeedback training, I think, you know, even the same, you know, whether you're an athlete, whether you're an executive, whether you're in the military, um, like I said, the, the competitive type A high drive, it is challenging to sit down and do breathing. Yeah. Um, so this is where I found it very, very helpful to first. So when I have somebody come in, um, some things that I have found helpful, my approach, I don't go straight into heart rate variability, um, biofeedback training and, and doing a resident frequency assessment. First thing I sit down, we have to, um, I, I, a lot of times I'll talk about you know, how to help them complete their stress cycle. And mm -hmm. that a big portion of completing that stress cycle is helping them decompress and offload that stress from their bodies because they can be resilient and really good at managing stressors and coping with stressors, but that stress is still locked in, stuck inside their body and it just accumulates over time. And so first we'll talk about some healthy ways to help them offload that stress and to begin thinking like, okay, when I'm offloading stress, whether that's exercise, meaningful social connection, uh, breath work, meditation, laughter, you know, et cetera, et cetera, a creative hobby, that these are actually rest endeavors, um, recovery, rejuvenation endeavors, same thing with sleep. And so helping them see that 
their body is really like a Formula One race car. And a Formula One race car still has a pit crew and that they need to come in and take those brakes and they're changing out tires and going under the hood and, you know, changing spark plugs. And then they go back out and they ride fast and aggressively again. And so helping them see that it's like, well, how can we get these pit crew rest stops kind of throughout the day? And kind of giving them a model to kind of work from or inviting them, encouraging them to find these short little pit stops, you know, throughout the day. And so we talk about this idea of rest is not being lazy. It's actually essential to high end elite peak performance. That is key to our resiliency. And, and sleep is a huge portion to that. So we'll, we'll go into um, the importance of sleep and how to optimize their sleep. Um, but this kind of sets the stage for like, okay, I see and I understand why this needs to fit in. Um, it's important to know when you work with any type of peak performer, like what buzzwords are going to catch their attention. So um, for instance, in my work with the military, if you talk about cortisol and testosterone, that kind of catches people's attention. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big thing for sleep. But also when we have a dysregulated nervous system and we're constantly in survival mode, um, that is also going to, like I said, impair our autonomic nervous system, mm. which is important for healing, which is important for our learning and picking up new skills and, and being resilient to stress. So I would say first, um, we have to paint the picture for these high level performers to see that this is not wasted energy. This is not being lazy. Use the peak buzzwords that they're really going to um, be interested in. You know, let's say if I was working with a performing artist, maybe the the need to be creative and to tap into that, you know, intuition and, and creative insight. Well, we need a balanced nervous system for that. So after you lay the foundation, know the buzzwords that are going to catch their interest. The next step I found is I'll, I'll work on mindfulness some mindfulness techniques and skills to help them be able to start to slow down because mm -hmm. um, it's really hard for them to sit and do their breathing or to even set aside time to do their breathing. So um, we'll I'll talk about the difference between being, like what is it like when we're actually being present, you know, um, just really being able to be in our environment and soak, on, soak in and observe what's going on around us versus always in do mode. Like, okay, I need to do my breathing, whether can I just allow myself to be present and, you know, allow myself to, be aware of what's going on inside my body, or can I allow myself to be present and observe and notice, let's say the beautiful landscapes around me if I'm outside in nature, and then begin kind of integrating and, and doing the breathing. Um, so after mindfulness, I'll take them through a couple of mindfulness exercises, and depending on what they might need, whether it's a body scan, a mindfulness of breath is always a huge one, that's the first step. And then, you know, your thoughts on leaves is always a super popular one for what to do with the, the active wandering mind. Um, then sometimes I'll go into body scans because we, um, I like to use the analogy of our, um, you know, our, our mind and our body can become disconnected. Mm -hmm. And so just like we, you know, resync up our AirPods to our phone, we have to resync, re, you know, Bluetooth our mind and our body together because that's where your source of your infinite wisdom is for your intuitive decision making or whether, you know, you're in a creative endeavor, even, you know, creative problem solving, you still need to tap into that intuition. So I'll often say these are exercises to help you re-Bluetooth, re-sync up the mind and the body. So we're not living in thriving mode in our head, or, or excuse me, living in surviving mode in our head. We need to thrive. So we need to get the mind and body connected. After that, I will, um, you know, it's also blessed in that Ina taught me capnography biofeedback. So I have found capnography biofeedback to be very, very helpful in teaching um, functional, like effective breathing. Because many of the high performers I work with that I've learned over the years are over breathers. And I think that's just, you know, in particular, when I think about how I learned, um, you know, deep breathing, you know, back in my early sports psychology courses, um, words do matter. And some of the words and the cues that we use encourage competitive type A you know, high performing people to overdo it because we overdo everything because if we're overdoing it, you're just, you know, more is always better. Not. Um, <laughs> so, so I'll do a little bit of capnography biofeed work. And so if we're good to go into mindfulness, we're, we have got good respiratory chemistry. Then I get into heart rate variability biofeedback training. Um, and that's where I'll typically do a modified version of, um, of the, of, um, 
the, the HRV biofeedback training, uh, Paul Lair's work in the, the 10 session protocol. I unfortunately never have the privilege of doing 10 sessions. Mm. So just so, happy to go into it. any more, you guys tell me. <laughs> Um, I, I, first of all, I, uh, I've been taking, you know, mental, mental notes, you know, throughout everything, um, you just said, I love you metaphors, uh, yes. the formula one, you know, Bluetooth, uh, <laughs> it <laughs> makes a lot of sense, you know, totally, it, uh, totally connects with people. Um, uh, and I love the, your way of talking about completing the stress cycle, just to go back, you know, to, you know, what you were talking about earlier, that, uh, that idea that recovery uh, is not lazy time. It's not something you have to do because you're weak, uh, but rather it's part of stress cycle. This is how you do stress better, right? You know, if you, if you give yourself some downtime once the challenge uh, is over, that's what's going to help you be better at stress uh, the next time something comes around. Um, I, I, I love that. So there you go. Another piece of Christine wisdom that goes going in. I have memory. to say, I, um, the completing your stress cycle, unfortunately, I can't think of the authors. There's two female doctors. Um, the book burnout actually, mm -hmm. uh, very much speaks about things that we talk about in our work, but the way they were able to package it was, was just really nice. So I, I do have to throw a shout out to the book burnout. Um, unfortunately I can't remember the author's names, but they, they just beautifully said it. Well, I guess we'll have to look it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe yeah. it. I, I just completed about a month ago. So maybe I'll I'll look that up for the, the show notes and put that in there. But uh, I, I'm interested because you mentioned the short term aspects of your work. So, uh, you know, you, you're I, I would love to just hear how you approach that, uh, because sometimes the case studies that I've seen Ina present or others present they're working with individuals for months um, at, at a time. How do you approach that, that the short-term nature, I guess? What, what kind of things do you send people off with to continue the work that you might start? I'd just love to hear how you approach uh, that aspect of, of the nature of your work. Yes. Um, and so just my, the nature of my short-term work is that the clients I work with, I don't often... Um, get to see on a super regular basis. Like I might be able to see them regularly, weekly for about a month. It might be every other week. Um, but then, you know, they have to go out and do their jobs. And, and while I, during, you know, I'm typically embedded in my work with the military. So I will get to see them again. It just may be like six months. It could be a year, you know, it could be a few months. So I found that I have to be very impactful in a short amount of time. Um, so that does not mean, you know, a challenge is always getting metrics on this, um, but more, I think, you know, I, I, I believe that your merit is when they leave, do they feel like that they received, you know, education tools and techniques that help them, um, you know, be better at their jobs and to keep them safe and to improve the quality of their life. And I feel like my job is done. Um, but yes, it will be a little bit challenging to get some objective metrics. So, it depends on, so first, you know, you have to meet them where they're at. Like, what are they interested in learning in? First, you know, do a needs analysis. Like, what are you looking for? When you leave here today, what will be success to you? Um, mm -hmm. And so from there, I have to work, okay, what is success to you? What are you, what are you looking for when you leave here today? And then I'm like, how much time do you have? So meaning like, if, because sometimes I would, you know, I, I get um, clients that come in and they're like, okay, so Christine, I'm about to go out the door. And um, yeah, I, I need you to tell me how to better regulate stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm having trouble focusing, uh, poor memory, very irritable. What do you have for me? Because I'm leaving tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, great. So I'm like, how much time do you have? <laughs> so in that case, that might be, I'm like, can you spend the afternoon with me today? Because you're mm -hmm. fortunate I can rearrange my schedule. And they're like, yes, I can give you the afternoon. So I might do maybe about, um, you know, we take breaks, take lunch breaks maybe like three, three hours, two to four hours, um, just depending on what they have. And then I have some people are like, okay, well, I only, I only have a month and I can meet with you like maybe four times once a week. So depending on that, um, what I found helpful is we first kind of going through what I just described to you, um, kind of taking into account of like, how do they decompress? What are they doing to reset? And then I try to plug these techniques into what they're currently doing. Um, but I will start out with, with capnography biofeedback to make sure that they, we have good respiratory chemistry. Cause like I said, many 
of the um, performers I work with, not everybody, but many have some uh, dysfunctional breathing habits. So breathing in too deep, breathing in too effortly. So I know that if I can teach them, if they can see the difference with capnography, I do a lot of negative practice. Like let's do chest breathing versus diaphragmatic breathing and see how that affects your CO2 levels. Uh, let's do deep breathing you know, or effortful breathing versus effortless breathing. Mm. Let's do, you know, let's do even breathing versus an extended exhale, just depending on the person's unique situation. I let them play around with the capnography. I'm like, okay, do we know what good functional effective breathing looks like? Yes. Okay, good. Then we all kind of go into some mindfulness techniques and then I'll do a resonant frequency assessment with them. And then from there, once we find out their resonant frequency, so the breathing rate that optimally helps them um, engage the parasympathetic. Uh, Ina, since you liked my analogies, some I, uh, I tend to, well, it's pretty common, but the sympathetic as the gas pedal and the parasympathetic as the braking system. I've had clients that don't like brakes. So I say, okay, it's your downshifter. Then, <laughs> you know, you can downshift, right? Mm -hmm. That's great. So um, once we find their resonant frequency, I'll, you know, have them breathing comfortably with a breath pacer. We'll talk about what works best for them and their situation. So it might be a breath pacer app. Um, I do recommend the optimal HRV app. If they have a um, heart rate monitor chest strap, some do, some don't. And the ones that don't, I'll put them on uh, just using, I love it that you guys have just a breath pacer option. And so I will send them off. So I try to do the education, the learning up front, And then once I have the resident frequency, I send them off because we've talked about how to fit it into their schedule. We've talked about the importance of it. We've made it, we've packaged it in language that they'll, they'll buy into. We've talked about mindful language. You know, we've talked about the autonomic nervous system. We've talked about respiratory chemistry, good breathing. They're aware of their own breathing habits. They have some mindfulness techniques so that they can sit and allow themselves to do their breathing and then they have their resonant frequency assessment That's their number to do right. and so do they uh, then go off and practice on their own do they uh check in with you uh do they do they track like how do they, how do they make sure that they are staying where they need to be and making progress fantastic question so this, uh, I will be honest, I have to um, trust them and rely on them. I know that's not the best answers because sometimes I don't have any way to check in with them. It's just that when they come back or if they reach out to me over email, um, you know, they'll, usually they'll, they'll let me know the benefits that they've seen. Um, like I said, just, um, you know, better, uh, better control in their, in their performances, better motor control, um, their ability to focus, and uh, often it might be their ability to integrate it like as part of their wind down routine before they go to sleep. So more I'm getting subjective uh, data of how they've seen improvements. Um, not many of my clients have wearables, so it's kind of hard to track um, how their HRV might be changing over time. So that is a, that is a challenge. I kind of have to go by their subjective um, experiences yeah. and well, subjective matters a lot right if they mm -hmm. if they feel better right ultimately ultimately that's what matters yes. uh, you know it's yeah. nice to have data to show it too but you know if they if they're noticing the change in themselves that's amazing yes well, the challenge is that organizations that you know fund our positions want objective data yes. so it data. becomes it becomes it becomes challenging um Let's see. I think you guys were, uh, I have had, like I said, not many of my clients, um, have, can do the wearables, but I did have one that did have a, a, an or ring and he actually was by doing his, so they get an or ring. Um, he was able to see that, you know, one thing he found very helpful, I'm trying to go back was I love that how you guys have the resin. They can see, you could see your resonant frequency when you're doing a mindfulness exercise, you're still able to see the pacer. So I have received some good feedback actually on that option that they really, um, they really enjoyed that. But this, I did have one client who had an aura ring and what they were, now I don't, um, can't use the aura ring regularly. So I, I'm going off of this one client's experience. Um, apparently aura ring has a, I guess a stress level during the day and then your, your recovery during the day. And so he was able to see changes in that recovery score 
for his daytime rest or recovery, however Oren puts it out. And that was a huge buy-in for him that he could see that by regularly doing his breathing one to two times a day and his mindfulness that he was able to see a significant reduction in his stress um, score and an increase in his uh, recovery. Fascinating. I, I have a question, and Nina, I'd, I'd love to get your your thoughts because I know you you worked with the military population as well. My my work in, in the military has been more on the after side of it, um, especially around PTSD, um, you know, and and all the the, the negative impacts that war can have on individuals' mental health. And one of the things that, that I've been really just kind of fascinated with, because I've seen the, the difficulty a lot of people have is you need certain types of traits to be on the battlefield, um, to, to be in the, a combat experience. And then they come home and those traits become maladaptive very quickly. Um, that there, there's a real struggle for adaptation, which can lead to a lot of, of mental, relational, medical issues um, if they don't get the help they need. So, so I just kind of wonder in your work where folks are going maybe on deployment, high intensity, then coming back and now they're going grocery shopping for their family. Uh, just kind of, is. do you have any thoughts about how to help People make, I think, some of the most dramatic life transitions you can possibly make. Um, oftentimes, you know, you're you're in, you're deployed one day. A couple of days later, you're you're back uh, with your family. And just any thinking either of you have on how to help people make some of these difficult adjustments. I'd love to hear what Christine uh, thinks, and I, I can add a few sentences after. Oh, uh, Jose, let's give you now time, some time to talk. <laughs> um, let's say, so with, now, I, as you know, I just deal with performance, but mm -hmm. there are like shades of gray. So I, I am fortunate that I have a great, um, our psychology team is fantastic. And so I do a lot of work with our, um, our social worker. And uh, a lot of times I'll get referrals for teaching self-regulation skills because that pairs very nicely mm -hmm. in the clinical work. And so I found, um, so... Yeah, over the years, I've gotten lots of referrals for, for working with people on their ability to, uh, to decompress, to learn proper self-care, and also to learn to better regulate their autonomic nervous system so it preps them for the, for the for therapy and for that in-depth work. Um, but also, I've found that in terms of managing chronic stress, uh, that ability to give them these tools to help them regulate their nervous system is essential uh, for helping them go to, to to work on that wind down routine before sleep, because yeah. sleep is crucial to removing toxins from the brain in your deep sleep. And, you know, the ability to get proper sleep is going to be crucial for um, minimizing PTSD down the road yeah. and stuff. So if we can give them tools to help them get high quality sleep, I think that can also play a huge factor in um, in uh mental health challenges uh down the road and helping them manage the chronic stress and it goes back to completing our stress cycle and, and decompressing yeah. and meaningful yeah. social connection i i i think uh, i mean i i agree with absolutely uh, everything and i think uh self-regulation here is key which is exactly where um heart rate variability uh, training comes in right because um a a, a big part of the transition from you know deployment to being home uh, is self-regulation, right? You know, it's a uh, it's a ability to adjust to the change in your external and internal environment. Um, and uh, people with lower heart rate ability have a much harder time doing that. So if we can improve um, HRV, then on a physiological level, it's it's going to be easier uh, to move from uh, what your body needs to do in deployment to what your body needs to do when you're home. Um, and I think in another part of this is uh, your frame of mind, you know, the way that you interpret situations, the way, you know, even so simple things like the way you interpret sounds or the way you interpret people's words or, you know, the, the way that, you know, you interpret what's uh, what's going on in a situation, you know, the way you interpret what's a threat and what's not. Um, you know, all of that is that same um, agility and flexibility um, that, uh, you know, we need to move from 
um, you know, here, uh, this kind of sound or this kind of word means threat. And when I'm home, that just means normal life and nothing, you know, there isn't nothing dangerous going on. In order for the brain to, to be able to make that assessment uh, quickly and easily, again, higher heart variability helps because we know that higher heart variability is linked with um, more flexible uh, cognitive process and ability to switch uh, from one type of cognitive process to another. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, your clinical team relying on you uh, to help folks with self-regulation is, uh, you know, perhaps unbeknownst to them, but they're tapping, uh, you know, exactly um, into that power of HRV in, in training quick, uh, or yeah, quick ability to, uh, to shift from one interpretation to another in one state to another. Yes. And, uh, thank you, Ina. One thing that's, Two things that just came into mind as I was listening. Uh, one is the power of social connection. I have found that fascinating. And just in terms of just me personally, um, well, I, said I can't normally wear an oar ring regularly during the day, but I have just been fascinated by how meaningful social connection, how that can greatly impact at least my heart rate variability. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but so, we know about the, you know, uh, meaningful social connection, being connected, feeling connected to yourself, but, and most importantly to others, how that impacts um, your your ventral vagus. And I think that is something that we, we underestimate. So how can we encourage others, you know, like within the military, anybody who's in any type of high risk trauma scenario, the important of finding meaningful social connection where you feel um, related and seen and understood um, by others and how that impacts your ability to be resilient with all the different challenges and adversity uh, that you might be facing. I love it. So, 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 so true and important. Um, And, you know, this makes me think of a, uh, you know, a person I worked with um, you know, who was having trouble adjusting to life um, after deployment. And, and uh, he, this person's feeling was that, you know, I'm not connecting, like, you know, I'm so used to, um, you know, just kind of, you know, being part of this, you know, very insular uh, team um, and, you know, you know, having to kind of disengage from everybody, everybody else, given the kind of work that this person was doing and now coming back and having to reconnect with um, a spouse and children and friends, um, having that objective data. So if we were, when, uh, when this person was talking about uh, uh, these experiences, you know, being hooked up to um, heart variability and specifically to the spectral analysis, you know, seeing the high frequency, which is the, you know, vagal activity, uh, the very low frequency, which is well, vagal withdrawal uh, or could be uh, sympathetic activity. Um, and then that low frequency baroreflex parasympathetic activity, um, just being able to see the shift uh, in uh, what in what's going on? You know, we're kind of looking at us in, in colors, right? You know, going from you know blue to green to red. Um, and when this person was talking about uh, children and spouse, you know, there would be these spikes in uh, vagal activity in the blue and high in the high frequency spectral power. And pointing that out, look, uh, you may not. Uh, consciously realize that connection but your body is feeling mm-hmm. it your nervous system is experiencing it look look it's right there um and it starts talking about something else you know no longer socially connected and that vagal activity decreases uh so just and again being able to point that out and then, well let's come back you know tell me a little more about you know the cute thing your child did uh, or said this morning um and here we go there is that vagal activity coming up again so uh, that mind body disconnect uh, that christine you were talking about we were needing to reconnect the bluetooth uh mm-hmm. you know, even the colors align here very nicely <laughs> to reconnect the bluetooth of uh, you know here you know here i am you know with with my family, um, I don't feel the connection, but oh, my body is experiencing. So let me look at that. Let me see what I'm actually noticing right now. Oh, there it is. I actually do feel a connection. I'm oversimplifying, of course, but um, it did kind of happen like that. Being able to see that objective data on the screen uh, in the moment helps people look at, well, what am I experiencing? The kinds of things that they wouldn't have noticed if they weren't prompted uh, by the spectral display. And I so so completely agree with you just how important social connection uh, is. Ina, thank you. I never thought of uh, talking, you know, having these con- these conversations about meaningful social connection while hooked up and seeing the changes in the power spectrum that you described. So thank you. Yeah. Awesome. 
So, so again, a question more, more for, for both of you to, to chew on is one of the things we've kind of talked about the, the relaxing, the recovery nature of mindfulness and resonance frequency breathing. Uh, Christine, I would love to get any thoughts you have on, you know, because peak performers want to perform at very high levels because usually they're in fields, sometimes with the military, literally the highest stakes you could possibly throw out there. But even for CEOs, for athletes, uh, livelihoods, games, businesses, jobs um, are on the line for, for these people. And I would love to just get any of your thinking is, is using residence frequency, not only as a recovery, but I wonder if you utilize, you know, the biofeedback to, to get people ready uh, for those highly, you know, stressful events uh, so they can bring that uh, level of performance they want uh, when, when the moments uh, kind of at its peak uh, requirements. Excellent question. So this is where I would have a discussion you know, with the performer on how can we integrate this very important skill to you know, decompress, to regulate, uh, to recover, to rejuvenate, whatever word you want to pick. How can we integrate this into your daily routine and your daily performances? And so where I found it's helpful to integrate the, the breathing is during any time that there is a pause mm -hmm. um, in a performance or a transition. So I talk a lot about how to integrate the breathing once we've acquired the skill. We, this is where the your daily, you know, one to two times daily for 10 to 20 minutes to acquire the skill, to strengthen uh, that parasympathetic nervous system, to deliberately stimulate that vagus nerve, to improve our heart rate variability. Now that we've acquired the skill, now we're going to talk about integrating and inserting it in these key performance scenarios. So Realistically, where you're going to integrate it is during a pause, a break in the action, or a transition. Um, I feel like these transitions are super, super important. Um, and I mean, this is really can be applied anywhere. So let's think about, um, let's say, as you know, you mentioned CEOs or any type of you know leader in the ex executive environment. So let's say, like you know, we've talked about sports or outside of sport or outside the military. We all have transitions throughout our life. I mean, it could be, what's our transition from our car to when we enter the office in the morning? That is a transition. Mm -hmm. Or when we're transitioning, a lot of times I'll talk about when we're going from one meeting to the next meeting, there's a walk down the hall or in the elevator or you know, from one building to the next, viewing these transitions as an opportunity to rest, to, or for rest, meaning let me reset, whether it's a control alt delete, hitting the reset button, I need to recharge. Um, you know, maybe I'm going to hit the, the recharging booth, so to speak, as I'm walking from, from one meeting to the next. And that is an opportunity to integrate and do your breathing. So maybe it's just, you know, five easy, low and slow breaths or 10 easy, low and slow breaths. Um, actually, I think in uh, another book I, I do recommend is... Um, uh, and Leah Lagos's Heart, Breath, Mind, I think she calls it like a power 10 or a power five. I'll uh, talk about integrating your breathing in there. And um, that kind of gives like, oh, okay. So instead of your mind spinning, you know, out of control or whether you're leaving one meeting and you're carrying those emotions with you into the next meeting, or if you're jumping ahead to the future and you're, you know, I mean, yes, we want to be prepped and have an idea of what we're about to walk into. But after we have prepped and we're ready to go, if we're still spinning out of control, worrying about the outcome of our next meeting, or what conversation might, you know, might uh, evolve, we're not truly in the present moment. And the present is where you're going to get your your curiosity, your openness, your ability to observe and notice and, and pick up on the energy. So your breathing is a way to ground and center yourself before you go into that next meeting. Um, so a lot of times I like to talk to integrate it in the transitions and set an intention of how you want to be before you walk through the doors of um, that next performance, whether it's a meeting or whether it's, you know, jumping into the pool or stepping on a soccer field or jumping on a horse, whatever, whatever your performance that. might be. I, I love it. And I, I love how you talk about it as a skill as well. Like I, I really, you know, because mindfulness for 
a lot of people, you know, I'm, I'm really hesitant. Like, just give me a minute. Just start there. Count, count your breath. You know, Enos taught me how to teach healthy breathing to people. So, you know, you using those skills. But, you know, I, I've started like as a former basketball player. And I, I'm realizing, Ina, that most of my analogies involve free throws at this point. So I need to I need to diversify that. But it's like my mindfulness, my mindfulness practice is like shooting all those free throws outside the game, you know, to build up that skill set. And it, sometimes, honestly, it's kind of boring, right? I, I don't like get all juiced up to practice 20 minutes of mindfulness, but I do it because just like I practice free throws is when things get stressful, I've developed that skill set to bring that calm, that peace, that focus, you know, from my practice into that moment. So to build a tangible skill, to try to help people understand like mindfulness is more than just sitting and breathing. There, there is that practical, powerful uh, piece of things that, that the benefits that come along with it. And so Matt, one thing I'll mention is formal versus informal practice. And, and Nina, I remember during our mindfulness training, we talked about this a lot. Um, you know, formal practice may be sitting down with your breath pacer app, breathing at your resonant frequency, but informal may be, I'm walking the dog and allowing myself to slow down and really use all my senses and notice my surroundings and practice my breathing or just practicing my breathing without a breath pacer while driving, you know, just as I'm driving, I'm mindfully driving and going back into that low and slow breathing may not be perfect at your resident frequency, but it's going to be pretty darn close. Uh, absolutely. And just taking the time uh, to do that goes, goes a very long way. Informal practice is hugely important, uh, you know, meeting people where they are, right? You know, you don't have five minutes, 10 minutes to set aside. All right, let's, uh, you know, take, you know, five minutes where you're already doing something else um, and add this uh, uh, into it. And most of the time people end up buying, buy, buying in and then they can set aside five, 10, 20 minutes um, a day. But to get their buy-in first, you know, just integrated into uh, into whatever it is that they're doing absolutely fascinating well i love to ask all my my guests these questions uh <laughs> as, as we kind of wrap up but now you, you've got a decade in the field you're you're obviously working on the cutting edge with these peak performers as you look into the future um as our technology we've got rings we've got straps we've you know, we've got patches you can put on. Uh, I used to think the military had probably access to all of these. And then I realized to get a device to the military takes like so much paperwork that, you know, it's about the hardest, uh, you know, mailing I could possibly do is to send a bunch of readers to somebody working with the military. So uh, on one hand, having a lot of access, on the other hand, uh, you know, having some challenges there. I'd love to see like where you think this is going. How how do you think in the next 10 or so years, um, where do you think your work will go? What what technology do you think will help support your work? Just love uh, from your perspective to see where, where you think we're all going with this uh, exciting field. Yeah. Let's say one thing, I think just, oh, one of the, you know, one of the outcomes of COVID was, having it be more acceptable to do more virtual work. So one thing, you know, I think it's fantastic that Optimal v HRV came out and we have a very easy way to conduct um, heart rate variability biofeedback training with clients. And I mean, I think that's, it's beautiful in the essence that it opens the doors for clinicians to work with people who, you know, may not be in their area. It allows clients to be able to get this training that may not have somebody trained in their area. Uh, but then also, I think um, in terms of working, whether it is a sports team, whether it is the military, um, or maybe just just very busy executives, I think being able to do high quality heart rate variability biofeedback training mobily is key. Um, because just like, uh, you know, you have that consultant, that clinician to be able to check in with you weekly, you can do that virtually, have a discussion on what's, you know, how are you, you know, acquiring these skills? How are you integrating them into your daily life? Getting some coaching on how to enhance and perfect the skill and, and tailor it to their unique situation. So the fact that you guys came up with it with a very valid and reliable um, 
you know, mobile app to do the training, I think is huge. And that opens doors because, you know, one challenge is when you work with, um, you know, a group of high performers and you'll see the same thing in the professional sport world, they are, their travel schedules are gone and it's not realistic um, to be doing training in the office with, with the clinician. Uh, I think you'll see the same in professional sport. Maybe it's in their off season, but they actually have the time. And, um, you know, a lot of athletes, depending on the organization, may not want to wear biofeedback because that could be used possibly against them. So they might need to come, you know, on their own to you um, to do the training. And so you have this, you're allowing this to be, um, you know, confidential and, and done at a high quality. So I think that is really huge for, I think, the field. How can we do more mobile or virtual biofeedback training? Um, second, I see, I, you know, I, with the wearables, I think we need high quality, reliable wearables. If we're going to look at some of these data, um, or at least high quality measurements, we can look at descriptive trends. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of security, making sure we have to make sure that these wearables are secure and they don't get hacked because that is going to be huge, um, for any type of organization. Cause we, you know, have to be very careful and mindful of the security and, and that data. So I think that's a huge one um, to kind of tackle and work through. Um, but I think wearables are huge and very helpful for helping um, helping any performer become aware of you know, these little habits and behaviors that we have that could be impacting our heart rate variability, everything from the food that we eat to the, the liquids that we can consume, um, the adult beverages to, you know, stress and our, our social connection, I think it can be very insightful. But too much can also, um, you know, what do they call it, uh, orthosomnia, where people become, you know, too obsessed and into the, their sleep actually gets worse because they they get anxiety about what does the data, what does the number mean? So um, I think really working through the wearables of being valid, but also working through some of the security concerns would be huge. Um, and then I think, um, you know, like I said, I, I've really been interested with integrating the respiratory chemistry, the capnography with the heart rate variability and a way to do that in mobile training. So if there was a way to capture heart rate variability, like if the performer has a pause, like they're sitting or they're standing, if we were able to kind of time capture um, some of these to see, hey, when you actually have a pause or a transition, how well can you reset? Because mm -hmm. once they're moving, we, we can't reliably look at that data. But if there was a way, that would be, uh, that would be interesting. But I, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff with capnography and integrating it with heart rate variability. Very cool. Having it, Ethan, having Ethan, it do you mobile. have any final questions or comments? Yes, yeah, yeah I, don't have any final, I don't have any final questions. Just to echo, you know, I would love to have a, you know, mobile cap, uh, uh, capnometer. That would be amazing. Um, and to have a device where you can uh, measure HRV at the time of that reset. So you can see, you know, like, you know, hit space bar, <laughs> you know, the way you can on the computer, right? Mm -hmm. And mark it. You know, this was my HRV right before. This is when I took my breaths. This is what happens right after. That would be such great feedback. And, you know, that one is technologically probably possible, you know, that we may be able to figure that out, you know, in, well, in, a, really, in the near future. Yeah. And that would be, so if we were to do something like that, I do, you just triggered my memory. It can't be too cumbersome for the performer because then if it takes them That's out not, of their element, it's absolutely not helpful. Absolutely not. not you know, if absolutely it, not. If it falls off, not helpful. If it's not reliable, if they sometimes get data, they sometimes don't, that's not helpful. They're, you're gonna lose lose their rapport, either lose their interest right away. So it, it needs to be very, um, very minimally invasive. It needs to be highly accurate. And then the ability to get those short moments. So yes, my wish list. Yeah, it's, it's kind of unfortunate heart rate variability is so sensitive to movement and other things like that. If it was just a little bit more, I think we could do a lot more uh, with it. But I, I love that idea that that just would be fascinating to see. And I think just so, especially for the population we're talking about, so, so important and insightful as well. So I have one more fun question uh, to wrap up yeah. our conversation. As I, as I was looking at your bio, 
uh, to kind of prep for our talk. I, one thing that, that I, I just got to ask, how does somebody with a bachelor's in ocean engineering get into biofeedback and performance? I just, I just had to ask how there must have been something that happened somewhere along the line uh, that made you, I would imagine, do a pretty big career or academic yes. shift. So uh, just a fun question to kind of end on. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, that was uh, pretty interesting. Uh, so yes, I worked as an engineer um, for a few years after college, and I did undergo a pretty massive career change. Took a, took a lot of guts and a lot of courage. Um, so what interested me in it? I uh, I was a swimmer and a rower in college, and um, while I was swimming, I went to Virginia Tech. I swam a little bit at Virginia Tech, and I was you know kind of stuck in a stuck in a performance slump. I was a breaststroker, and uh, I was home swimming. Uh, one summer break back with my club team grew up in the DC area and uh, we had a sports psychologist come speak with my club team back in the day and so this wasn't even at Virginia Tech and he kind of did a little talk for us and I will admit I didn't really go in with the best attitude you know swimmer swim at 4 45 in the morning so my thought was I'll get to sleep a little bit more <laughs> no <laughs> practice will be shorter but then as I was listening to him I was like wow maybe this is, maybe this is part of my problem. So I uh, signed up for some sessions with him. I used like all of my summer lifeguarding money That's to go awesome. work with him. Saw so him maybe three times uh, before I went back to college, back to Virginia Tech and um, had a huge impact on my swimming. I basically had a focus issue. I was highly distracted while I was swimming. What a surprise. And uh, it made a huge, so just changing what I was focusing on when I was swimming made a drastic impact on my time. And um, he also helped me with a timing issue that I had. So basically it was a um, a lot of focus, attention control, cueing, and uh, it made a huge impact on my swimming. And I was like, wow, what a cool job. Like yeah. you take people's goals and dreams and you help make them a reality. That's really fascinating. Um, I didn't know if you could really find a full-time job doing that. You know, I was doing engineering <laughs> at the time. And the more I realized I really enjoyed working with people because I was, you know, doing less coaching swimming and I was, you know, less away from swimming and, and team type stuff and more into my engineering internships. I was like, man, I really miss working with people, people more. And I really helped uh, helping people accomplish their goals. And so I took a huge leap of faith and switched into sport and performance psychology. <laughs> I love it. How cool. I did not, I did not, I have not heard this story. Thank you. Very cool. Well, Christine, I want to thank you so much. Uh, we'll, we'll put we'll put a little bit of that interesting uh, bi biology people or the bibliography people <laughs> can find online uh, in there because your journey has been fascinating and your work is is really inspiring. And I'm sure to be that person uh, for other people now, uh, like that sports psychologist was for you. I can see your face just light up as you talk <laughs> about that transition. So it has been an absolute joy. Uh, to talk with you today. I really appreciate you. Uh, appreciate you being part of the Optimal family uh, as well. It's a huge honor to support your work. So uh, appreciate you. You're welcome back on the podcast uh, anytime. Uh, love to have you back. So um, always thank you to our listeners. You can find show notes, other things at OptimalHRV.com. Christine, Ina, it was a total pleasure to talk to you with you both. Uh, appreciate both and all the work that you do. Thank you, Matt. Like I said, it's been an honor, a true honor to be able to, to speak with both of you today. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Christine.